Hello everyone, my name is Andy Brown, Creative Specialist at Foundry, and welcome to my latest webinar, Procedural Prop Generation. Now, during the webinar, I'm going to be looking at how to use Modo's procedural modeling system to quickly generate generic assets. And whilst doing this, I'll be able to touch on a few of the new features in 11.1. .1. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, just write them in the chat window, and I'll endeavour to answer them during the Q&A at the end of the session. So I've been modeling for many years, and what I've come to realize is that modeling isn't just about pushing points and polygons around. It's also about finding ways of making your modeling more efficient. Now this can be achieved by UI customization, custom keyboard shortcuts and scripts. What I've become increasingly interested in is developing models that help me model. And this has become a lot easier with the introduction of rigging, procedural modeling and mesh fusion into Modo over recent years. Now the kinds of models I'm talking about are sometimes called smart assets, but I've never really liked that term as it's artists that are the smart ones after all, not the asset. I prefer to use the term deep asset because it's a model that has functionality that goes a lot deeper than its initial appearance. Now coders have been producing plugins that do this kind of thing for many years, but with all of the functionality available to you now in Modo, you'll be amazed at how far you can take things without touching any code at all. So what I want to do first is show you some examples of what I call deep assets. And all of them were produced because I was faced with a very specific modeling problem. So wheel rims are really hard things to model well, mainly because of the complexity of the shapes and also the repeating nature of those shapes. So in an attempt to make the whole process a bit easier, I came up with this rig, which uses a combination of procedural modeling and also mesh fusion. So by creating a profile, which creates the initial sweep of the wheel and also three or four fairly simple mesh fusion items which act as either primary meshes or trimming meshes the whole rig will auto generate a wheel for me and the beauty of this is that all i need to do is either edit or change one or more of those input meshes and i'll create a brand new wheel now, because it's a rig, I can also build some level of control into it. So if I double click on this locator here, you can see I've got some fairly simple controls which allow me to play with how many spokes the wheel might have. So if I want to see what my design might look like with just three spokes, then I just need to type in three into these two values, and we've got a completely different wheel. Now, this not only makes the process um, a lot quicker, but more importantly, the whole process is now much more experimental. So the activity I'm involved in is now no longer a pure modeling process. It's now much more of a design process. Similarly, modeling shoe uppers can also be a real challenge due to the complex asymmetric shapes and also the tight tolerances between layered surfaces. So in this scene, I started out with a simple last shape and using procedural modeling, I generated three um, specific layers that sit perfectly next to each other. Now, I could have created as many layers as I wanted to. And then I used mesh fusion to simply cut parts of each of those layers away. So if I select this item here, I can grab one of these cutters and I can move it, move it around and play with it till I'm happy with the design. And because all of the layering is being taken care of through the procedural modeling, I've got a simple control here which allows me to change the thickness. So if I want the leather thickness to be, say, two millimeters, I can just type that in and the whole thing will change. But all of those layers will always remain tightly sitting next to each other. So again, this really helped to change the activity from being just a pure modeling process into being a design process. So dealing with 3D text elements has been made a lot easier in Modo since the implementation of the procedural text item. But creating things like dials where text has to follow an exact pattern or path can be a real challenge, particularly if you need to be able to change things. So with this scene, I created what I call a kind of dial 3D text generator assembly that I can kind of drop into any scene that I'm working on. 
And all I need to do is type in the required parameters and out pops a perfectly aligned 3D text that I can easily change. So you see here's, here are all the controls over here on the right. Um, so I can define the, the radius of the of the dial, how many text blocks there are, the start and the end angle, how big the text is going to be. I can put a multiplier in there. So I've wanted this to be a speedometer, for example. I could just change this to 20. And everything will update. And also I can change the font. So I want to change the font from Arial to... Just type in Helvetica here. We'll find Helvetica Light. Just select that. And it'll update again. So this is a really good example of a Modo scene, which is an incredibly useful tool. Now this approach is also really useful when it comes to more generic objects, and in particular situations where they include repeating structures. And a really obvious situation like this is when you're trying to create a building and define windows. Now this scene is my skyscraper maker scene. And with it, I'm just able to punch in numbers and create a huge number of different generic city blocks. Now every element of this model is procedural, with a fully textured model being generated at the end of it, including all of the randomized lighting that you can see here. So let's punch in some numbers. So let's create a city block that's 30 by 30. Four hundred meters high. Uh, let's just play around with the windows. So let's have 20 windows that way and that way and 30 that way. And as you can see, there are a vast number of controls available to me and I could have put a lot more in there if I wanted to. So as you can see, a building is incredibly quick to define with this scene. And the scene itself only took me a day to produce. So in the long run, I'll save a ton of time, particularly if I need to create an entire city. Now, any of these scenes would have made a good example project for this webinar, but the one I've chosen is a really mundane object, the type of object you wouldn't want to spend a lot of time on, but something you might need to make a lot of, and that's a wooden table. But the important thing about this project is that the end result has to be an object suitable for real-time use, and that's the really interesting bit. So when approaching a project like this, I always like to break the object down, kind of deconstruct it, if you like, into its unique elements, and then approach them individually. So a generic wooden table, in my opinion, is really three distinct objects. The tabletop, the frame that it sits on, and then the legs. So let's start with the tabletop. So in a brand new scene, because I'm splitting it up into different parts, I'm going to do the same thing in the schematic here, just to help me organize everything. So I'm going to create a new workspace, and I'm going to call this tabletop. Hit OK. And I'm going to start with a cube. So I'm just going to hit Add Operator, type in Cube, and double click. So when you think about a tabletop, you can have square tabletops, you can have round tabletops, you can have tabletops with rounded corners. Um, there's, there's lots of variations. But what we need to decide on is what the starting point is going to be, and then what controls we need to be to be able to deform it into any shape that we want. Now I'm going to start with a circular tabletop. And there's a very good reason for that, and it'll become clear as we move through the project. So what I want to do is create a single polygon and then radial sweep it around the origin to create a circle. So with the cube primitive here, I'm just going to drop the size on Y to one millimeter and zero on Z. So now we've got a very thin little polygon running along the x-axis. Now, I need to be able to sweep this around the origin at the moment. The center of the cube is in the middle. So what I'm going to do is do a little bit of rigging. So if I bring in the positional channels for the cube, so I just select those channels and hit Add Selected in the schematic. And then I also add in the x scale channel. What I can do is just link up the x the size X into the position X and the whole cube will move along. Now if I halve that value this point of the cube will always be sitting on the origin. 
So if I select the little noodle, come to this drop down, channel modifier math, math divide, and I'll just divide that by two. And if I select the cube, you can see it's always going to be sitting there. Now, if I adjust the size on X, let's have two meters, you can see that that point is always going to be sitting on the origin. So let's make sure that the cube isn't generating UVs. I'll just reduce the amount of things that are going on. And the next thing we need to do is radial sweep this. So I'll go add operator, radial sweep, double click, and it creates the circle. Now one thing you have to make sure of is that the selection type is set to polygon so that we're actually um, sweeping that single polygon around and not the actual edges from that polygon. Otherwise, we'll have a single polygon left behind. So let's just increase the count to something like 50. And there we've got our circle, our circular tabletop or the start of it. Now, the reason why I've used the radial sweep tool is there's a great new feature in 11.1. And if you look down here in the helix generator, we've got this square option. So just by checking that, I can turn it from a circular tabletop into a square tabletop just by activating that boolean. So the next thing we want to be able to do is to give the tabletop some thickness and to do that we'll have to bevel these polygons up. So let's go over to polygon mode here. Now because I'm, I'm going to have to select these polygons this count value on the radial sweep is going to be really important because I might want to change um, the density of the mesh at some point in the future. Now, because I have to select those polygons, if I if I um, increase that count higher than 50, then the bevel is going to start breaking down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to an initial value that's really high. So I'm going to set it to 100. So if I just select all of those polygons, add operator, type in polygon, and select polygon bevel. And let's just move that up a little bit. Now, just to show you what I mean, if I go back to the radial sweep, to the helix generator, if I reduce the count down below 100, everything holds together. But if I take it above 100, you can see it starts to fall down. But you know, I'm never going to go any higher than 100 when I'm creating this tabletop anyway. So let's drop that back down to 50. Now, wooden tabletops often have really interesting kind of molded edges, and we can create that really easily in Modo. So if we go to the polygon bevel operator and expose tool pipe, and we'll hit add tool pipe. And if I type in content, we can add a content preset in here. So I double click, and that gives us access to all of these kind of default uh, profiles, but we could we could easily create profiles of our own. So if I select one of those profiles, it will use that profile in the bevel operation. So as soon as I select one of these, you can see we get this nice kind of molding going around here. So we can kind of look through these. I mean, some of these work better than others. But with this in here live, we can you know change what that profile might be at any, at any time. So with that created, we're beginning to get a few things that we want to be able to control. So the next thing to create is the actual controller itself. So I'll come over to the item list here. If I create a locator, and I'm just going to name it Table Controls. And if I come down to User Channel, hit Add User Channel, and we need to define what those controls are going to be. So, so far, we want to be able to control the table radius. Again, channel name, that will create the internal channel name. Now the radius will be a distance. And hit OK. And we'll do another one. And this will be table thickness. Click in there to create the internal name. And again, that's going to be a distance. Let's add another user channel. And we need to be able to control the count, the poly count. When we create that radial sweep and the count is going to be an integer okay 
and finally we want to be able to control the square option and that is going to be a boolean so hit OK and now I'll just hit add selected to get that into the schematic so now we have to hook these up well table radius is very straightforward because that's just the size x on the cube so if I just drag the noodle and hook it up to size x you can see the table will disappear but now if I just type in a value in here, say one meter, we get the table back. So table thickness is the bevel operation. So if I go back to mesh ops and select bevel, there we have the shift amount. So we're going to hit add selected to get that into the schematic. And we'll just hook up shift. And again, the bevel will disappear. Um, Let's go to the user channels here and let's type in a value, say 80 millimeters. Okay. And HP count, that comes from the radial sweep. So if I select radial sweep and then helix generator, there's the count. And square comes from square as well. So I can hold down control and select both of those channels. Hit add selected. And there's square and count. I'll just get this nice and organized. So count will go into there. And again, it'll disappear. And square will go into there. So I select the table controls. HP count will be 50. Then we've got a table. And if I check square, the table will become square. So the other thing we need to be able to control is the content browser. We need to be able to easily select this content preset to change those profiles. And at the moment, it's kind of hidden away inside this mesh operation. So what we can do is create another locator and we'll call this preset selector. Now if we go back to uh, mesh ops. If we select the content preset and then expand the command history here uh, we go to history you can see the last thing we did here was select deformer so if I select that it says select deformer content preset blah 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 so what we can do is just select that control C to copy it go back to that locator that we created and now we go to assembly we can insert the command here. So if I control V there and hit return. So now if I just move this locator out of the way here. If I select this locator, it automatically selects the content, um, the profile presets. So at the moment, all I can create is a circular table or a square table. So to give me more to work with. What I want to be able to do is expand the table to create a leaf that sits in the middle. But I want to maintain the radius on either end. So what I'm going to have to do is use a deformer. So I'm going to go to add operator, I type in tran, and I'm going to select a transform effector. And that gives me a deformer that sits in the scene there. Now I want to only affect um, one side at a time. So I want this um, this transform factor just affect everything on the positive x and then I'll add another one that will affect everything on the negative x. So to define that I'm going to use a fall off. So I hit add fall off and I'm going to select a linear fall off. And let's set the axis on x and let's set the range to one millimeter. So I want it to be really really small. So let's go to the front and zoom in. And if I hit invert, you can see it's only going to affect things on the positive x. So if I select that transform effector and run the move tool, you can see it'll expand and create that distance in the middle. So I've reset that and I've named the fall off leaf pos x and I need to do the same on the other side. So I'll add operator again, transform effector, I'll add a fall off, 
So on X, one millimeter. And this time we just need to move it so it's sitting on that side. And I'll name that one Leaf Neg X. So the next thing to do is to hook up a control for those two deformers. So let's start by getting the transform effectors into the schematic. So I'm going to select that one, select the position X channel and bring it in. And then select the other one and do the same. And then if we select the control locator and we'll add a user channel and we'll call this leaf size. And this is, again, this is going to be a distance. It's okay. And let's put a distance of one meter in there. So if I then hook these up, see that one goes completely the wrong way so we need to make it negative so math multiply and we'll multiply it by minus one and then it goes the right way so if we hook this one up it works perfectly now the problem with this is that's not actually the leaf size because we're having a meter on that side and a meter on that side so although I've typed one meter in here we're actually getting a leaf size size of two meters so what we need to do is halve these values so if i select this noodle here math divide divide that by two and do the same here and now i know that's exactly one meter if i put two meters in it's exactly two meters so at the moment I can create a long table with semicircular ends. But what if I wanted a table that was basically square, but the corners were rounded? So in order to create that, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to add a similar leaf to control the depth of the table. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna add transform effector, two transform effectors with fall offs. And this time they're gonna be on the z-axis one millimeter and I'll just invert that and I'll do the same thing on the negative z so I've set that up and it's exactly the same steps as before just on a different axis and I've set up a new control here called leaf center size and now when I type a value in there I get a leaf in the middle. So what I've got so far is great, but I still can't control the radius of the corners. Now I can control them if I can scale these deformers down. So let's select these transform effectors and I'm just going to select the right scale channels. So this is going to be scale X and I'll add that in and we we'll just have to make a little bit of room and this one will be scale X as well we'll add that in and this will be scale Z and so this one so now we need a controller so I'm going to add a user channel and I'm going to call it corner radius the type is going to be percentage, but importantly, you have to put the default value at 100%. And hit OK. And then we just need to hook these up. And now if we adjust this, see the whole thing scales down. Now the problem we've got at the moment is because we're scaling it, we're actually changing the shape of the bevel on the edge and I don't want to do that and that's because all of those deformers are happening after the bevel operation so to fix that I just need to
put the bevel operation at the top. So the problem with the scene at the moment is that when I change this corner radius, the whole size of the tabletop changes, which isn't what I want. So what I'm going to have to do is create a relationship that adds um, a distance into this leaf distance, depending on the scale of the corner radius. So how am I going to do that? Well, I know that this corner radius is one meter because I set it here. So there's a relationship there between that distance and the scale amount. So one meter equals zero scale. 100% scale would equal zero. So there's my relationship and that can generate a value for me which I can then add in. It'll become clearer when I actually do it here. So I'm going to create a channel relationship and we'll take that corner radius and we need to create just like a kind of a dummy channel to hold the value for us. So I'm just going to select any item in the schematic there and add a user channel. I'm just going to call it blank and it's going to be a distance channel. Okay, and then I'll just hook that up there. So I'm going to define the relationship. So I'm just going to do this in the graph editor because it'll be a little bit easier to see. So I'm going to create, hold on control and alt and create another key. So I'm going to just define that relationship that I just explained. So when the input from the um, corner radius is zero, the value is one meter. So this, this distance is one meter. And when the input value from the corner radius is 100, then the value would be zero because this would be scaled all the way down. Now at the moment, this is, we've got like an ease in, ease out. I want this to be a, you know, a, a a value that changes in a linear fashion. So I'm just going to change this to linear, the, so the uh, pre and post behavior to linear. So what I can do now is take this value that's being held in this blank channel and add that in to the positional channels on these deformers. So as this scales down, these deformers are going to move out. So I'm just going to add some deformers in here. Sorry, some uh, math nodes. So one there, one there, one there, and finally one there. And then we can just hook this blank channel in. There we go. So now when I change the corner radius to 50, it almost works. And that because we've got that's because we've got negative values in these channels. You can see here I'm multiplying it by minus one. So instead of adding, I need to subtract these. So if I just select that node, I'm going to change the operation to subtract. And the same with this one here. So now when I change this value. It's going to stay the same size, but the corner is going to get tighter. And what's nice about this is as the radius gets tighter, I can then start playing around with the um, the density of the mesh, because if it's quite tight, I don't need so many polygons. So I've done a bit of housekeeping to the scene. I've tidied up the schematic, hidden items I didn't need to see, and I've named everything in the, in the item list and also made the controls a bit more visible. But I've now got a scene where I can, which, which I can create an enormous number of different tabletops. But the next thing we need to work on are the table legs. So let's create a new workspace in the schematic. Table leg, and hit OK. So the type of leg I want to make is a kind of turned wooden leg, the type of thing you make on a lathe. But I want to make it in a way so that I can easily change things, so I can play around with different designs. So to do that, I'm going to use a combination of a profile and mesh fusion. Now I've already got the profile in the scene here. I'll just make it visible. It's a Bezier curve, closed Bezier, Bezier curve. So I need a piece of geometry now to form the basis of the leg. So if I create a new, new layer, and I'm just going to create a cube. And let's make it 100 millimeters on X and Z. Uh, 
time we need. I've got a few segments, so 20 segments on that way, and four on X and Z. We can change that later on if we want to. But I want to make sure that the leg is always on the negative Y so I can scale it. So I'm going to do the same trick as we did before. So if I grab position Y and size Y and add that into the schematic and hook size Y to position Y. And then if I add a divide node and divide it by two and then take the result and multiply that by minus one. Now, if I adjust the size, the leg is always going to scale on the negative y. So I'm just going to adjust that so it's sitting the same kind of scale as that as that profile. So what I want to do is create a piece of geometry from this profile and then use that as a cutting object. But I want this curve to be live all the time so I can change it. So what I'm going to do is create a new mesh layer. And I'm going to add a merge mesh node. And the source is going to be that profile. So what it's going to do is basically copy that profile into this procedural layer. And that will make sure that the original profile is still an editable object. And then what I can add is a curve fill. That will fill it with quads. I want to reduce the resolution on that. Drop the fill steps down to five. And then I want to run a radial sweep. That will create a piece of geometry. I want to make sure that the selection type is polygons. And we want to invert those polygons. So that gives me my two mesh items. Let me just hide the tabletop for now. So to create the fusion object, I'm just going to bring up the modeling tab, uh, palette. So I'm just going to shift select both those objects and we'll create a fusion item. And then I'll select this object, make it a trimming object, select the blank and trim. So if I just hide those two objects now, you can see what we end up with. So we will end up with a very convincing turned wooden leg. And the great thing is, if I want to change anything, I just go to this profile, select it. I can grab this bezier and change it and play around with that design. And I can even swap different profiles in if I want to. So this allows me to design a leg. What we need to do next is actually create geometry and array it underneath the table because at the moment this is just a fusion item. So if I create a new mesh item, I'm going to add operator and add a merge mesh node, I can actually add the fusion item as a source. So now we've got an actual procedural mesh item we can use. So add operator again and we'll run an array. And if we go to the array generator, see at the moment we have this offset value of a meter which we can use within the rig. But if I add an extra leg, the leg gets put another gets put another meter along the x-axis. And I don't want that. So what I'm going to do is check between. And that way I know that this offset value is going to be the maximum distance between the you know, between the whole the whole item or across the whole item. So next we need to make sure that it's always centered underneath the table. And we can do that with the deformer. So I'm going to add operator and add transform effector. And what we need to do is add in the X and Z position into the schematic. And then we also need to add in the offset X and Z from the array generator. So now we need to do the same trick as we did before. So if we hook up offset into position, and then we need to divide it. And divide this one by two. And then we might need to make the result negative. So 
So now if we go to this array generator and increase the offset to maybe two, it's always going to remain centered. So I brought the controls into this schematic layout and hooked up all the controls that I've needed. So I can control the length and the width of the legs, and I can also control the overall footprint of the legs and also how many legs there are. So the final piece of geometry I want to create is the frame. And that's pretty simple, so I'm just going to do it in the same workspace. So I'm going to create a new mesh layer and go on add operator and just add another cube. So let's select all of the size channels and also the position Y channel and bring those into the schematic. Now the size of the frame is, is always going to be the same size as the overall size of the legs. So I'm, I can just take this offset X value and put that into size X and offset Z and put that into size Z. But the scale on Y is a different matter. We actually want to be able to control that. But we also want it to always be below the Y axis or on the negative Y. So we're going to do the same trick again. We'll just hook up size Y to position Y. We'll add a divide node, divide it by two, and take the result and multiply that by minus one. So now we, if we change that, we can adjust that size. So we need to do a little bit more modeling here. So if I go to polygon mode, I'll select the polygon on the bottom and also the polygon on the top, add operator and add a delete node. That will delete it out. And then we can add a thicken operator. And we just bring that in to create that frame. So I've added in the controls that I wanted for the frame, and now we've got our high poly table. But it, it's all in separate layers. I want to get everything into one single layer. So I'll create a new mesh layer, add operator, merge meshes, and the sources need to be HP frame, HP legs, and HP tabletop. So now we can hide all the construction layers and now we have the table in a single layer. Now what's going to make this project really interesting is the ability to automatically generate a low poly baked object from this one. Now we've already got all of the controls set up and all of the rigging worked out. So we've just got to think about how we can create an object in parallel using what we've already done. Now this object has three sections. Um, the frame is as low poly as it's ever going to be anyway, so we don't have to worry about that. So let's think about the legs. So the legs being generated by the fusion item, so we just need to bring that into a new layer. So I create a new layer, I'll run merge mesh, and I want to use the leg fusion. So now we've got another high poly leg in the middle of the scene. The next operator we need is a poly reduction or poly reduce operator. So I'll just double click on that and then we need to set a number of polygon target. I'll just use a thousand now but we can change that later. We can actually add that as a control as well. And it'll take a couple of seconds to work through. So it calculates it. There we go. So there's the, the low poly leg now. And the next thing we need to do is array it in the same way as the high poly leg. So I'll hit add operator, add an array. And if we go to the array generator, if we look at the other array we've got in the scene, we've got need count X, count Z, offset X and offset Z. So I'm just going to select those, add those into the schematic, and then we just need to hook them up. So we just take this value, and we just hook all four of those up. And the other thing we need to do is make sure that between is checked. So to get the legs in the right position, we need to use a transform effector. So I'll load one of those in. And we need the position X and Z. 
So I'll bring those into the schematic. And then we just need to take these exact values and hook those in. And that's the legs done. Now for the tabletop, we could just do a simple poly reduction. That's quite a crude way of doing it. I want a bit more control over the poly count. And also I want, I want to just bake this molding into any low poly object. So what we're going to do is rebuild a low poly version from the steps on the high, of, the high, of the high poly version. So I create a new layer. We'll add a cube. Let's hide the high poly version for now. So with this cube, we want it one millimeter on Y, no UVs, and we want position X and, and size X. So we'll add those into the schematic and then we just need to hook these values up. So I'll just set size Z to zero, and then we need to do a radial sweep And we'll set the selection type to polys. I've got the helix generator. Now we come down here, we need the, here we need the count and square. Set the count, square, we'll add those in. Kind of match that up. And then we'll just take square and feed it into there. But the count is gonna be different and that's gonna give me my low poly control so the next is the bevel. Before we do that, we'll just go back to the helix generator. And like we did before, we set a high value in there initially before we did the bevel. So I've got polygon mode, we'll select those polygons. And we'll do a polygon bevel. And we just want the shift amount. We'll add that into the schematic. And we'll just set link those shift values. Now, because the molding angles in a little bit, I'm just going to give it a slight inset. And then I'll set the count on the helix generator down to a more reasonable number. Let's have 25. And then we can set that as a control. So the last thing to do is to mirror the four transformers that are deforming the top of the table. So I'm going to pin this dialog here and we'll go type in tran and then I'm just going to add four transform effectors and I'm going to move the polygon bevel to the top. So I'm just going to bring one of those into the schematic and I'm going to go to the first transform effector here. Double click on this yellow triangle and that brings in the transform um, for that particular effector. So for this one, I'm going to bring in its effector just by clicking on that triangle. And then we need to have position X and scale X. So I'll select it, scale X, I'll add those two. And then we just need to link those two values. Now you notice that the table's moved over to one side. Um, and then what we've also got in there is a fall off and we can use the fall offs that we've already got. So with, if I select this node, you can see it says fall off. So we've got a yellow triangle. So I just double click on that. That brings in the fall off. So what I can do is just link that fall off into this transform. And now it's all hooked up. So we just need to repeat those steps for the other three. So with that finished, you should have a low poly tabletop that's exactly the same shape as the high poly table. Okay, so now we need to get all of those low poly objects into a single mesh item like we did with the high poly table. So I'm gonna create a new mesh. We'll add a merge mesh operator. I'm going to add source, I'll just pin that. And we want the high poly leg, sorry, the low poly leg, the low poly tabletop and the high poly frame. And now we should just have high poly table and a low poly table. So next we need to set up this low poly table so that we can bake from the high poly table. Well, the first thing we need is a material. So if I hit add operator, type in MAT, 
we can add a material tag and we'll just define the name of that so we'll call it low poly and if we need to bake then we also need a UV map now there's a great new node in 11.1 .1, and it's called create UV map and this is a procedural version of the regular UV create tool so it allows us to do planar uh, cylindrical spherical and atlas projections but procedurally so we just need to define the name of the UV map so again I'll call that low poly and let's take a look at that UV so just double click on it in the UV list so at the moment it's a planar projection let's come to properties I'm going to change that to atlas and now if I make a change to the model so say I change this to being a square table as soon as I make a change the model will update and so will the UV map. So I'm going to go over to the shader tree and I'm going to define the material. So I've got to add layer and I'll add a group and also a material. If we go to the group, I can assign the polygon tag as low poly and then we can add some materials. So I'm going to add an image map. Here yeah, we've got this wood texture. It'll automatically pick up that low poly UV and I might want to adjust the tiling, maybe two. And we also want a UV map to bake too. So I'm going to add a blank color texture and we'll call this table norm. Save that. I just want it to be a small texture, maybe 1K. Hit OK. We'll change the effect to normal. And we'll just make sure that it's using the correct UV map. So go UV and UV map is low poly. There we go. So to bake, we just got to make sure that the high poly table is in the background. And then we can just right click and bake from object to texture. Set a baking distance and hit OK. So now if I hide the high poly, you can see we've got that molding baked into the low poly object. So just to make the baking easier to do, let's just go to the render menu and we'll add a bake item. And now we just need to set this up here. So the target mesh is going to be low poly table. The source mesh is high poly table. Texture output is table norm. We want to bake from source. Uh, let's have, say, 200 millimeters distance on there. So if we make a change, so let's select this and make it square. I can just go back to the bake item and hit Bake Selected. And it'll bake it straight away. So I've just set things up in the advanced viewport so things are easier to see. And I just love the improvements to the advanced viewport in 11.1. .1. It's so much faster and also the shadows are so much nicer. Now, granted, setting up this scene took a bit of time. But with it now set up, the process of designing and creating a table which is ready, baked, ready for real time, is now incredibly quick. So let's create a different table. So let's just bring the uh, high poly back. We'll select the controls and let's have a table radius of 300 millimeters, a leaf size of 300 millimeters, a corner radius of 40%, and a leaf length, sorry, a footprint um, length of 1.2 meters. And let's take one, two of the legs out. There we go. And just to finish off, let's select the profiles and let's have a look at some different profiles. I quite like 
that one a little bit different okay so with that done we just make them both visible go to the shader tree bake items and we'll just bake selected and there's our table ready to go so there you have it a procedural prop generator for real time now you wouldn't use something like this to create a hero model but when you're faced with having to create lots of objects to populate an environment in the long run scenes like this would be a huge time saver now this is just a table but there's no reason why the same principles couldn't be applied to a wide variety of similar generic objects so with that it's time for some q a